Hello, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my Go programming class. And now I want to walk through a simple example of a program a little more complicated than Hello World. And with that, we're also going to do some unit tests as just a starting point. So I'm going to go back to the playground and we're going to start over with Hello World, but we're going to make it a little more complicated. Now, in some languages, uh, the function main takes parameters that represent the command line arguments, but Go doesn't do that. Instead, we're going to import another package. So I'm going to import the package OS, and I'm going to change <clears throat> my string here to return well, I'm going to change my string to format a parameter from the command line. Now, what you get os.args is a list of parameters, and we don't want the first one. The first one is indexed by zero. All modern languages do that. It represents the name of the program when you run in Unix, typically. And so most systems are going to produce the same thing. The, the zeroth argument is the name of the program. And so the first thing after the program you typed on the command line is os.args sub 1. And this is going to break. So there are two problems here. First of all, the playground's not a good place to do this because I can't actually provide command line arguments. But it is a good place to show what happens if there aren't any. So I didn't type any command line arguments because the playground doesn't let me. And so this function crashes, or this really the, the indexing operation crashes, because there is no os.args sub 1. So I'm going to continue by using REPL.IT, or REPLIT, because that's an environment in which I can do just a bit more. And we're going to start creating a little project there. I'm going to create a main program, and I'm actually going to create a, a little library to use with it, and some unit tests. And then we'll run them here, because this is an environment where I can pass things on the command line. So when I start in REPLIT, I have a main file, a main.go. It's at the top level of my directory. Now, it's typical to put, actually, the main program inside a subdirectory in the repo. And so I'm going to create that directory now. I'm going to add one called command, cmd. And I'm going to take my main.go file. Well, it doesn't want to let me move it there. So I'm just going to create a main.go in there. And then I'm going to take the original main.go and get rid of it. We'll let Unix do it for us. Uh, there's a file go.mod. I'll explain that in a few minutes. So let's leave that alone for a moment. So I've got my main program now. OK, and I need to copy back into it the sorts of things I had before. So I'll add my main function. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to check and see, do I actually have more than one argument? Because again, the zeroth argument should be there. It's the program name. And if the answer is yes, I'm going to use it. And if not, I'm going to ignore it and print something else. So we'll just add a couple of things here. All right, so this is my program. And now, because I put it in the command subdirectory, I need to type go run dot slash command. And when I do that, it should just run. And it prints out hello world. And it printed that because I didn't give any command line arguments. And so we took the second branch of the if statement. All right. And now we can see if I actually give it an argument, then it takes the first branch, the if part, not the else part, and does that. Fine. OK. So I want to go a little bit beyond this. We're going to make this a bit more complicated as we go. 
Okay, so I'm going to create my own little package. It's going to include a function to do our, our saying for us. And so what I'm going to do is call that hello.go. Notice it's not in the command directory, it's somewhere else. And in hello.go, I'm going to call this package hello. And I'm going to need to import fumpt because we're going to use that. And I'm going to create a function say. It takes a string, returns a string. Help if I could type. So our little function basically is just going to say hello whatever the parameter is where the parameter is an, a string name. One of the things I want to show here is the parameter order or the type order is after the variable name, right? If you're familiar with C-like languages, and this actually goes all the way back to Fortran, first you give the type like int and then you give a name like a or character and b. But actually in Go we do it in the order of languages like Pascal and Modula where the type name comes afterwards. It turns out to be a little easier to parse it that way, and it avoids one of the embarrassing mistakes that people make in C using pointers. Um, our little function doesn't do very much. We're going to go back to the main program, and we're going to change this and we're going to import our package. All right, I think I put it all together. And so now I should be able to go run that. And it should do the same thing. Oops. OK, and I'll explain what that does a little later also. OK, so I've created my little function say. It takes a string. And I'm going to call it from the main program. So I've modified my main program to import a package hello. And we're going to run it. And I didn't give it any parameters, so it did what it did before. And if I give it a parameter, now it does that. What I want to do now is I want to add a test file. And I'm going to call that, uh, using a Go convention, hello underscore test dot go. And it has tests for the hello package. So again, we're going to be in package hello. But now I need to import a module called, or a package called testing. And I need to create a test function. And the way we do that is we actually start with the word test with an uppercase T. And then we continue with some other words. And these always take a pointer to a testing.t. And they do something. They don't return anything. If I want to fail the test, I'm going to call something on t to make that happen. So in here, I'm going to initialize a variable and check it. So want is what I think I should get back, and got is what I'm going to get when I call say, and I'm just going to check and see, and if that's wrong, then we're going to call the error function on t. It's a way of reporting an error in the unit test, and see what happened, right? Now, if I run this, the way I run this is to run go test like that. And obviously, I type something wrong somewhere. Um, it would help if I type the variable name. So let's try that again. And it ran. It tells me how long it ran. So there weren't any test files in the command subdirectory. It ran the main package directory test files, and they succeeded. 
it doesn't tell me anything because it passed. Now, what happens if I go in here and I put a deliberate mistake in here, and then I do that again, and the answer is it's going to fail the test and it's going to report that the test failed. Right? I wanted hello test and I got hello test with two exclamation marks, but that was because I did something to the test. I could have also done it back in the code. I could have gone to hello and taken out the exclamation mark there, and if I run the test, same thing, it's going to fail. All right? And if I put that exclamation point back where it belongs, then one more time I'll run the tests, and now they pass again. Okay, so that's not terribly interesting. What I want to do with that, though, going forward is I want to deal with more than one command line argument. I want to print several names. I could say, hello, Matt, Kathy, Adam, something. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and make my say function a little more interesting. I'm going to have it take a slice of strings, and I'm going to have it check. All right, we'll call those names. All right, so if there aren't any, I'm going to substitute a, a fake name. And if there are, we're going to do something a little different. Okay, so what I've done now is I'm going to return a made up string. I'm going to have this, the, the word hello, comma, and then I'm going to join the various names, however many there are, with commas in between them, and put an exclamation mark at the end. And I need to import another package because I'm going to use the strings package right, for the join function. And when I do that, it should just work. So let's go back now and rerun our unit test. And it doesn't like me, okay? So here's the thing about Go. We're not using Fumpt anymore. And because we're not using Fumpt, we're not allowed to import things we don't use. Uh, a Go file has to import everything it uses and nothing that it doesn't. So we'll take that out. It didn't compile. The unit test didn't run because it didn't compile. We'll now run it. And I have a new problem. And my new problem is I changed say to take a slice of strings, a variable length array, and I need to go back to main. and change it. But So I moved the logic out of main. I don't need the logic that I had anymore because I just moved that logic into the save function where it belongs. And what I'm going to do, just I'm just going to pass the slice of strings not including the first item. So this little expression here, the one colon, says start with the second item till the end. And it has a very neat property. If there aren't any, if there isn't a second item, then it'll just be an empty slice it'll be a slice of length zero, and it's perfectly legal. We won't crash the program because of that. So now we'll try this again. We'll try running the test. Okay, And it doesn't like me again because I need to go back and change one more thing. Right? The, the, it's not a string anymore. Now it's a slice of string. So we'll try that, and now we'll go back and run the unit test. And voila, it works. So I can also now go back and run my main program. And that works. And we'll try it with two names. That works. And because we like the Wizard of Oz, we'll try Dorothy. It works with three names. Now, our unit test only tested it with one. And good unit test coverage means we should do more than that. So I'm going to go one step further and build out my unit test with some subtests. And I'll, that'll demonstrate a, a very useful technique in Go. Um, I'm going to go in here first. And create a slice of structs. Okay. Now, 
subtest is going to have a type. Its type is a slice of structures, and I'm going to create it literally on the fly. So it's anonymous. I didn't give it an actual type name. I just, I'm just creating this thing on the fly here in my test, which I can do. And what's also interesting is I don't have to fill in all the fields. So here's my first subtest. And interestingly enough, okay, and I have to put a little comma here to make the thing happy. I'm just going to give it a result with no items, so the items will always be empty. And we should get the default behavior. But before I do that, I need to add in some more logic, because what we're going to do is we're going to loop. We're going to do a loop, and that loop is going to be over the subtests. It's going to do them one at a time. And these are not, technically speaking, there's another way to do subtests where you actually call t.run on a subtest. I'm not going quite that far, but I have these various cases in my test, so I'm just going to call them subtests for the moment because it's convenient. All right. And I'm going to do one more little thing here, and that is I'm going to get, let me get rid of that. Okay, so I have this little thing. I have a for loop, and my for loop is going to run over the things in my subtest struct. And for each one, it's going to call say, it's going to get the result of say, and see if that matches the desired result. And if not, then we'll call an error function, and we'll print out some things about what happened. Now, I'm going to make it fail the first time, because I'm going to change the result so it doesn't work. And there we are. So we wanted something. And let's see, these are backward. Okay, let's try that again. And there we go. So I wanted hello world without the exclamation point, and I didn't pass anything in. And I'm going to change these two uh, markers. Now, so percent %v is a printf statement that says, you know, show this thing in some sort of a variable format. In the case of a slice, it'll put little brackets around it and include the elements. Now, there aren't any elements this time. So it showed empty brackets, and then it showed, uh, you know, got hello world with an exclamation point, but I wanted it without. I can make this test work by putting the exclamation point back and run it again. Now it works. So now I'm free to create some more tests, right? I'm free to add another case here. All right, and this time it'll be, all right, my items. will be a slice of string. All right, in this case, it'll be a slice with one item. I need a comma there also. Okay, so you'll notice a, a thing about Go, it wants certain formatting, and if it doesn't get that formatting, it's unhappy. And I can run that, and it's going to run two test cases. Right, it's going to run the case of no arguments and one argument, and now I can create one with two arguments. And I'll just change this to include an, a second string in my slice, Okay, and I need to change my result also to match. And now I can go run it, and it will have run 0, 1, and 2 arguments into the say function. And this is a good test. I mean, we've covered sort of the, the special cases of 0 and 1 and more than 1. I could try it with 3 or 4. It wouldn't really change anything. I think we get that at this point. And again, we haven't really changed main, so none of the rest of this should change. If I go back and run one of my old commands, that still works. So I've now gone through this simple example where I built out a little program. It does a little more logic than Hello World, 
So we had an if statement, we had a for loop, we had some structures, some slices, and I'm going to explain those things in more detail. I'm showing them to you. I think they should be fairly intuitive for folks with programming experience, but we'll talk about them more. Now, I want to circle back and do one more thing before I'm done with this lesson. We had a textbook that I recommended at the beginning, and I want to talk about what changed since the textbook was printed. Right? That book was published, well, it was probably written in 2014. Go was three or four years old in terms of its public release from 1.0. And there's some things in there that have changed. I want to call out a few of those. Um, so there's some minor language changes and some minor tool changes. And then there's one very significant tool change. If you go back and read the book, it's going to talk about this environment variable called GoPath. And it used to be you had to install, in like in your home directory, you created a Go directory. And under that, you created directories like bin and source. And your projects had to be under that. And you pointed your GoPath variable at that directory, and then Go did the right thing. And you didn't have to call it Go. That's the point of GoPath. You could have called it UmptySquitch and still pointed your GoPath at you know, home slash UmptySquitch. And Go would find your, your little environment. And that was confining. So what's happened over time from about 1.11 to 1.14 in terms of Go releases is GoPath, it's there, it's vestigial. And instead, what we have is Go modules. And that was one of the big developments in helping people version and main manage dependencies in Go. Right? Dependency management is a problem. I don't want to go into it right now. Uh, it's been a nightmare for certain languages. And the Go folks have tried to create something that is workable. Now, I'm going to explain the most basic part of this. I have over here a go.mod file. And I had to modify it. I called this module hello. By default, it was called like module main or something. And it doesn't have anything really in it. That's fine, because I'm not using any third-party software. I'm not pulling anything out of GitHub to use. I'm only using the Go standard library. So let me go back to the slides. Right, and the slide just captures what I said. We're not using GoPath, we're using Go modules. And so what you do is you create a directory and in it you put a go.mod file. And in that you create a module name for the stuff you're building. And it's whatever. In my case, I have a main file and that main file is gonna pull in a package hello. It's my local package called hello where I have separately put into it my say function. <coughs> And so that all I need in it is write what's shown on the slide or what was showing on the screen a moment ago. Okay. Once you create that and then you start building your software, you're fine. If you do pull in a third-party package, and we'll do that eventually, Go will automatically add it to your go.mod file and show that as a dependency, as a certain version that you pulled in at that point in time. And with that, Go will be able to rebuild your software later. Now, I just described go.mod in terms of it's, it's function managing dependencies, but the presence of go.mod also allows you to ignore GoPath. So you have a directory anywhere. I can create a directory in any arbitrary place, put a go.mod file in it, and then start building out my source. And I don't have to worry about setting a GoPath. Go will know what to do with that file. Okay, so that was a simple example in Go of a slightly more complicated program and some unit tests to kind of show how things work. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about some of the basic details of the Go language so I can describe what some of those things you saw, what they are.